I'm Rebecca Hepp, Editor-in-Chief of Retina Today, and I want to welcome you to this episode of New Retina Radio. Today, we're talking with a panel of experts about the recent advances in gene therapy for inherited retinal diseases. Joining me today is Dr. Alan Ho, Retina Today's Chief Medical Editor, who is moderating today's roundtable. Alan? Thank you very much for the introduction, Rebecca. I'm Alan Ho, Director of Retina Research at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, and I am very excited to be here with several of my expert IRD colleagues, all of whom are very experienced in this field. Let's start with a quick introduction from each of you. We'll start, Aaron. Hi, my name is Aaron Agel. I'm a pediatric retina specialist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and it's an honor to be part of this panel. Art. Hello, I'm Art Sedasian. I'm a research professor of ophthalmology at Chaya Institute, University of Pennsylvania and I'm a biomedical engineer and a vision scientist interested in understanding and treatment of inherited retinal diseases. Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Panisi, and I'm an inherited retinal degeneration specialist at the KCI Institute in Portland, Oregon. Jackie? Hello, my name is Jackie Duncan. I am also an inherited retinal degeneration specialist, but I'm located at the University of California in San Francisco. And last but not least, Andreas. Hi, thanks, Alan. My name is Andy Lauer, and I'm a retina specialist, and I work with Mark Panisi at OHSU KCI Institute, Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Let me throw this to Mark to get us started. Mark, can you get us started by sharing some of the information about Sparks approved therapy since it's been commercially available for several years? And what are your thoughts on the recent publication showing perifoveal atrophy in a subset of patients treated with uh, veretagene. Sure, Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I think that treatment with veretagene, the Parvovec, really remains one of the great accomplishments uh, in the field of inherited retinal dystrophies. And we have treated now about 15 patients at at our site, and we've seen some really phenomenal uh, results. Um, Furthermore, if you look at the data coming out from the original trials, there's now five-year data showing continued uh, improvement uh, and durability in those patients. With regards to the recent study on parafoveal atrophy, I I think it's something that we need to take seriously and look at that. Of course, that study was from a subset of centers and it was a retrospective study, but it's important that we really look at the entire uh, set of patients that have been treated. And there have probably been several hundred patients treated around the world now. And we really need to understand what is the frequency of this um, event and how often does it occur? And and to do that, we really need to review all of the data. Aaron, you've treated a lot of patients with with Luxterna. Um, And Mark used the adjective phenomenal in some of the patients. Tell us what your experience has been, because although retina specialists are familiar with this approval, certainly many of us, myself included, have never treated a patient with Luxterna. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything Mark said. Um, We've treated 23 patients at our site um, and all of them have done um, really well, especially the children. I think the children in the age range of, you know, four to 10 have improved remarkably and the kind of stories that parents will tell you what they can do after surgery compared to before are really, really just heartwarming. Um, I have found that the adults who are treated who are in a more advanced state of disease may not benefit as much, but uh, there is the hope that we're going to maintain the vision they have, uh, and um, they all seem to be happy with their decision to have had the surgery. Are the original um, studies were done at Penn. Can you tell us a little bit about natural history uh, versus your experience with treated patients? Sure. Um, uh, the, um, the natural history of the disease is um, quite uh, uh, variable in the sense that some young patients have uh, lost a lot of uh, photoreceptors early in their lives. 
whereas other young patients retain a lot of photoreceptors. But independent of where they start, which varies from, uh, from patient to patient, there is a general tendency to go uh, uh, to lose photoreceptors over time. And the distribution of that loss um, does tend to show a, a perimacular distribution where there is a relative retention of the foveal region in general and, um, and uh, surrounding the fovea in the, uh, around the macula, there is a greater degeneration over time. So um, whether in this case, um, the, the findings are uh, due to the uh, therapy or due to the natural history, uh, obviously needs to be evaluated further. But in that paper, uh, there certainly was a lot of evidence that uh, the area of the treatment uh, was um, co corresponding to the area of the loss in, in a short period of time, in a matter of months. And usual natural history is not degeneration apparently in a matter of a few months. Thank you for your comments. Let me shift a little bit towards um, delivery of gene therapies. And currently, SPARC is only delivered surgically at specific centers uh, in the country. Um, and you are, uh, many of you are at the surgical centers. Um, but if we get to gene therapy uh, for broader and more common diseases, if we use gene therapy, not just as gene replacement for inherited retinal disease, but for ocular biofactory gene therapy, as we're exploring in neovascular, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, and actually atrophic AMD as well. There's, there are some gene therapy trials going on. Aaron, do you, do you think subretinal delivery, subretinal surgery, delivery of a therapeutic will be something that will be in the toolbox of all retina specialists that are surgeons, or do you think it'll be limited, more limited? Yeah, great question, Alan. Um, so although Lexterna, as was stated, is being delivered outside of a clinical trial currently, the FDA did require the selection of gene therapy centers, and we all performed hands-on training in live animals before we treated our first patients. And I think that kind of made sense for this novel therapy to be administered, including to young children. But once gene therapy is available for common retinal diseases, then I, I think it should definitely be expanded to all retinal surgeons. Um, my take is that many, if not all retinal surgeons already have experience with subretinal TPA delivery. So I, sit, uh, so I think that having something as simple as an educational video available online that describes the recommended steps, as well as providing contact information of surgeons who participated in the trials, that should definitely be enough to, to try to open it up to all surgeons to, to perform these procedures. In a clinical trial, there's the variability in testing the hypothesis of the therapeutic but there's also the confounders of the surgical delivery itself. Intravitreal injection, pretty straightforward. Subretinal surgery, Aaron's describing something that's usually been in the toolbox of many surgeons in this context of injecting TPA into maybe a, a detached macula with blood. Andreas, you've had a lot of experience with subretinal surgery. You've studied this and you've taught many of us um, about the utility of intraoperative OCT. Is intraoperative OCT something that'll be required or requisite, or is it just something that you find to be a, a tool and maybe a research tool to understand the procedure better when the retina is attached? Well, I, I definitely think that it's a, an important research tool. Um, you know, the way I think about it, that the thing that came to mind uh, after using intraoperative OCT um, in doing surgery for gene therapy, it was just like when I sat in a car and used backup cameras to park into a, you know, back into a parking space or, or parallel park. And I, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I feel like I'm better at parking using these other views. I don't think I scuff up the tires as much and, you know, the wheels as much. And so, it's that same concept where this additional view will help you see morphologic changes 
at the time of um, creating a so, uh, creating a subretinal bleb. So um, some of the morphologic changes that I look for is the the uh, how the tissues respond when the needle is uh, compressed against the retina and the choroid. It kind of helps you understand where the depth of the needle is. And, um, and it helps me know when I can start initiating a bleb. I feel like there's less anterior posterior movement uh, when I use intraoperative OCT. Um, then once the subretinal, bleb, subne subretinal space is created, uh, I know that I can continue to propagate that bleb at that location. And I should see um, uh, both axially with, the, with the, the microscope and in cross section with the OCT, the growth of the bleb. And this helps me understand that the needle is not in the suprachoroidal space or the choroid or, or creating retinoschisis. So I feel like it helps with that process. And then um, uh, there's other morphologic changes such as looking for foveal inversion. So, you know, the fovea is usually concave. And if the, if, uh, the injection is going a bit too fast, what can happen is the fovea inverts and it helps the surgeon titrate the, um, speed of, of, of delivery. And foveal inversion is really kind of an important sign and, and really you don't wanna go beyond that because the next step is a macular hole. So um, I have found it helpful. Um, I think that as people become more uh, accustomed to using it, they will find it helpful too. Um, so far, it's a very useful tool. They'll, they'll, there's all these other um, interesting uh, uh, retinal changes that we see during subretinal injections, but I think it helps refine the surgery and it also reduces the risk of complication. I think that's how it's gonna benefit patients. We were talking about Luxterna and, and the experience of the panel. We're talking about the generalizability and barriers to adoption of, of subretinal surgery and tools for imaging interoperatively. Um, Jackie, let me have you, um, if you will, tell us what is in the pipeline for those patients that are saying it's been almost three and a half years since Luxterna. When are they, what are the other inherited retinal diseases coming for us? We get that question all the time. What's promising, what's in the pipeline? There's a lot of exciting research underway. There are over 30 clinical trials currently going on right now. Some of the clinical trials that are um, underway right now, you know, other people on this call are participating in, um, and they include clinical gene therapy trials, gene replacement trials for things like uh, the most common cause of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa caused by mutations in a gene called RPGR. Um, there are clinical trials underway for patients with achromatopsia of the two most common genes associated with that disease, CNGA3 and CNGB3. Um, and there are, uh, there are lots of other ones sort of in the planning stages to try and address um, gene replacement. There are also innovative approaches being used for genes that are too big to fit within the delivery vector, the AAB delivery virus that was used to deliver the RPE65 gene. For genes that don't fit into that capacity, then there's ways of um, skipping over certain kinds of mutations with little fragments of DNA called antisense oligonucleotides. Uh, there are clinical trials underway for genes called CEP290 and H2A, which is one of the more common causes of labor congenitalis or early onset retinal degeneration for CEP290, and either Usher syndrome type 2 or autosomal recessive retinitis pigmentosa for H2A. And then exciting editing approaches with CRISPR Cas9 are being investigated for people with antisense, with uh, CEP290 mutations, um, in addition to the antisense oligonucleotide trial that I mentioned a minute ago, CEP290 is also being studied with uh, CRISPR-Cas9, and that's the first time in people that CRISPR-Cas9 is being delivered to modify DNA within, in situ, in people's eyes, uh, while they're still in their eye, uh, their body. Um, so there's lots going on. Um, for people who don't know what their genetic mutation is, there are also treatments being developed that are mutation independent, that are meant to just prolong, you know, preserve photoreceptors and prolong survival of photoreceptors and improve vision. Some of those involve delivery of stem cells. Some of them involve uh, 
or being anti antioxidant treatments um, have been investigated. So there's lots and lots underway um, for people who have really advanced vision loss. There are trials to try and restore some sight through things like optogenetics and prosthetics and also stem cells. So I would say it's an exciting time. There's lots underway, lots in development, and there will be even more in the future. I'm confident. 25,000 foot overview of what's, what's in the, in the pipeline and different strategies for patients that suffer from vision loss from these retinal degenerations. And from my two decade experience uh, of collaborating with art sedation, I don't know anyone else who knows the translational science any better art. It's been a real pleasure to work together across town. Um, so I'm going to ask you, given that, that overview, where you think the most promising um, strategies are for specific patient uh, diseases? If the goal of the therapy is to improve vision, um, inherited diseases, the greatest promise are those that have uh, lots of photoreceptors and relatively little function. So there's this dissociation and, and that there is evidence for that. And if there is evidence for that, uh, one can uh, molecularly intervene and try to bring up function. And, and one of those is uh, of great promise is what Jackie Mon mentioned which is uh, the septuagint form of LCA. Another one, a very similar disease, uh, very related disease, molecularly related retinal ciliopathy is MPHB5 uh, mutations causing LCA, which uh, uh, are uh, fascinating results uh, were shown in, in dogs and, and human um, uh, therapies uh, are hopefully uh, on the near horizon. Um, but uh, on the other hand, if the goal of the treatment is um, to arrest photoreceptor degeneration and stop the loss of vision, then, um, uh, then obviously inherited retinal diseases with a steady but slow progression are the ones that have the great promise. And again, as Jackie mentioned, the RP class of uh, uh, diseases uh, certainly come to mind. What I personally find most challenging are the dual goals when you are intending to simultaneously improve vision and slow down progression. Um, and, and the evidence for the attempt for such a treatment is relatively little. Uh, we recently, for example, evaluated autosomal dominant RP patients due to Rhodopsin mutations. And to our surprise, there was not only expected progression as it is in many of these RP conditions, but also an unexpected level of dysfunction and, and this means that um, uh, successful uh, gene-specific intervention could improve vision in the short term and arrest progression in the long term. And um, whether this is true for other conditions that are currently being evaluated um, remains, remains to be demonstrated. We still have a long way to go and the patients are literally counting days. I mean, we see them in our clinics um, and gene therapies um, really have come a long way since um, they, they came to a standstill in 1999 at Penn with uh, Jesse Gelsinger in systemic infusion of a gene replacement for his <clears throat> ornithine uh, transcarbamylase deficiency that caused a fulminant systemic inflammation and, and that 18 year old um, patient died. Um, we are now seeing, not just in gene therapy, but in some of the new anti-VEGF therapies too, issues of inflammation. Um, and whether or not that's significant and whether or not that will inhibit the efficacy of therapeutics, um, Mark, you've, you've studied these therapies for a while. Yes. Um, inflammation is a crucial topic. And I think that we have seen inflammation in almost every gene therapy program to some extent. And I think the best way to treat inflammation is to prevent it from ever happening in the first place. And so we're fairly strong proponents of prophylactic steroids, oftentimes um, oral 
steroids in addition to topical steroids. And I think we need more basic science studies as well to really understand what is causing the inflammation. Because there's still debate as to what components of the vector really do um, bring about an inflammatory response and why do some patients have no response at all and other patients seem to show uh, quite robust responses. And How long um, are, should we be following these patients for efficacy and safety parameters once we administer potentially one and done gene therapies? If there is inflammation that could be dramatic also within the first month, uh, but any of the effects that could uh, potentially change the rate of degeneration over the long term, for example, uh, would not be apparent uh, for many years. And this is not hypothetical. Uh, we know that in all of these inherited retinal diseases, uh, neurons die uh, at a slow rate. And, uh, and we have these days the tools to look at uh, the death rate uh, through uh, use of uh, adaptive optics like Jackie does, or through the use of OCT, uh, and, and determine over multiple years whether the rate of change of photoreceptor loss is uh, marginally changing. Jackie, what are some of the other challenges limiting the development of gene therapy treatments for patients? Well, there are many, which is why this has remained such a challenge in our field forever. I mean, it's really exciting that we're getting to the point where we're able to address some of these patients because this has been one of the hardest problems that ophthalmologists have faced for all of you know, the history of time, really. Um, it's true that there's a lot of different diseases. It's true that each uh, different genes that can cause retinal degeneration, and there are many that aren't very common. So it makes it hard to make it feasible for a company to develop a gene specific treatment for every single one of those different genes that can cause disease in, in small numbers of patients, let alone the people for whom we don't know what the genetic cause is. Um, so that's, that is certainly one challenge, but we've also touched on many of the other challenges on this call today, things like how to deliver the gene in a way that is not gonna cause inflammation or potentially cause harm um, by causing, you know, either detaching the retina, these very delicate photoreceptors may be uh, so delicate that even detaching them for a short period of time might not be um, safe, may not make, may cause problems to them, even although that's necessary to deliver the treatment. Um, whereas giving it through an intravitreal route may cause more inflammation and cut complications in that way. Um, other things include, like Art was discussing, it's hard to really know for sure exactly what's happening until you watch for a really long time. And that has been sometimes, and that has been a, a challenge in the field, which leads us to want to develop more sensitive outcomes measures um, to monitor how photoreceptors are faring, both functionally and how well they can see and structurally and how many of them survive. So I think there's, uh, you know, those are just, those are some, there are, there are certainly many, many more. Um, I think the field is really, I think it's, uh, the field is really congealing around the fact that we've seen some success. I think the RP65 story has really incited a, a lot, inspired a lot of interest in the field um, and motivated people to really try and work collaboratively such that we can identify greater numbers of patients that can be um, you know, can be available to receive these types of therapies and participate in trials. We've learned a tremendous amount about the genetic causes of disease, and there's still another maybe 30 to 40% of people for whom those genes remain elusive. So there's lots and lots of work still to do. I love the, those themes there, the collaborative retina ecosystem, um, working together, more resources, focusing even on less common diseases, gene therapy also, being applied to or being tested in more common diseases um, kind of points to this issue of, of delivery again. So let me, let me bring us back there across the country. Andreas and Aaron, I'm going to have you guys speak to your tips and tricks for subretinal delivery because you both have a lot of experience as well. Maybe let's start with uh, Andy. Over the years that I've been doing the subretinal injections, what I've uh, found is that you don't have to go fast um, to create a bleb. It's okay to go slow. 
Um, not too slow, but but it, it, I don't think we ever need to be in a rush. Uh, there's a lot of value in doing preoperative planning, looking at the anatomy. Um, in our center, uh, I work with Mark and Paul quite a bit, looking at images, understanding where is the target zone? What do we want to treat? Where is the patient going to get their best benefit? Um, you know, we, we specifically look at um, uh, certain areas and we kind of do pre pre-surgery drawings. Uh, that's probably not necessary for AMD or, or diabetes, but um, I think kind of being deliberate about where it might be a safe place to place the bleb uh, just kind of helps uh, uh, put the thought process before getting into the OR. And then the OR, just really concentrating on um, being delicate, uh, being calm, being steady, and um, just looking for uh, possibilities where things can go wrong and always thinking about those things and minimizing them. I'll say for me, uh, first and foremost was, you know, hearing from Steve Russell and Al McGuire, um, kind of their experience and what they look out for and, and going up to Casey and watching Dr. Lauer uh, perform machine therapy surgeries. And I think that was um, very important, but, you know, having um, done it myself now, I think, um, you know, there is some nuance to, to how much pressure to apply on the, on the cannula onto the retina. Um, that's probably one of the most important factors in combination with uh, the injection pressure. Um, we've migrated to using the Med1 microdose kit that uh, Andy Lauer here has, has kind of uh, popularized, I think. Um, and I think that's really been one of the greatest things that we've, you know, shifts that we've had improvements in, in the delivery by allowing full surgeon control of the injection pressure as you're applying the cannula onto the retina, because it allows you to really titrate and get that sweet spot of uh, pressure on the retina plus injection pressure to get that the blood to elevate. And I agree with uh, kind of pre-surgical planning. Originally, I thought that kind of the more peripheral or kind of thinner atrophic areas might be not a great place to start a blood, but actually I found that those are in some ways the easiest places to kind of get the blood to, to rise rather than going in closer to into the macula where the retina is thicker um, and you can kind of have other issues with elevating the blood. We, um, the, your comments, both of your comments resonate and the, the tools and the systems uh, have improved and the collective experience, even from some of the Monday morning quarterback video sessions that we do in gene therapy trials, I think are going to help all of us collaborate and do better um, as we move forward in these different studies. I, I'll comment that there's a, there's a real difference in the uh, ease of ability to elevate the neurosensory retina um, using say the Med1 cannula system, um, syringe system and a 41 gauge cannula. If you compare the young patients versus the macular generation patients that uh, I've had the opportunity to have experience with. The young patients are um, significantly more um, challenging in a way because you have to really ensure that there's no residual cortical gel, which very easily obstructs the 41 uh, gauge cannula. And so the 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 pre-planning and thinking is to use some, in my hands, some triamcinolone particles to make sure that even though you think you saw a PVD or induced a PVD in a younger patient, that there's no residual gel left. A little bit of gel will block that cannula. And Andy's taught me to go slower in the young patients and, and we're doing that now. And we also will bevel the, the cannula with a Van S scissors to create an angle um, and use intraoperative OCT. Um, I, I never thought I needed it, but I, I like using it to get the cross-sectional real-time view as well. Let me shift this in, uh, to one issue that I've had questions about, but there, there is a free genetic testing. And Aaron, um, is there an ideal way to order a molecular test? Um, you know, we have, I use this one saliva sample ID your IRD that's free and has a panel, uh, but I don't know about the others. Are there others? Can you give us 
can you give the retina specialist who doesn't really do eye inherited retinal diseases some advice and guidance on what, what to do and how to, in, how to interpret those? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I think ordering and interpreting molecular testing has always been an obstacle. And uh, as, a, as a retinal surgeon, that's something I've essentially had to learn from scratch and I'm still learning from, from many uh, and some on this panel. Um, I think in the past, it may have been due to cost and logistics, um, how to interpret variant classifications. But as you mentioned now, amazingly, there are so many options, including free options. So kind of like which to choose. Um, they should be more or less the same, but they're really not. And, and like I said, I'm still learning more and more, and more about this and, and the panels are changing um, almost on a monthly to yearly basis. So unfortunately, these tests can have important differences based on testing strategy, gene coverage. For example, this free and vitae panel that you mentioned omits the RPGR gene and mitochondrial genes, unlike another free program, the My Retina Tracker program with Blueprint. But on the other hand, it does include some rare IRD genes and genes for albinism. Um, one might think whole exome sequencing would provide complete coverage of any and all genes desired, but Sometimes this strategy can miss large deletions and duplications. Um, it can also miss deep intronic variants. So we've been having some discussions regarding this with my colleagues, Paul Yang, Jose Polito, and, and Mark Panisi, who's here. And I think, you know, the bottom line is go with any large panel test um, that you find easily available, but really know the limitations of the test um, you are ordering in the context of your patient's findings. For example, if you're concerned about X-linked RP, you may not want to go with the, you know, ID or IRD program. Yeah, I think that I, I agree with what Aaron said. And I think one important thing to remember is that when you get genetic testing, it's really a, a snapshot in time. And it's also, there's somewhat of a, a probability um, to it. And, and the way I always explain it to my patients is it's a little bit like fishing. If you go fishing and, and you don't catch a fish, you know, that doesn't mean that there's not a fish in the pond. It, it means that you didn't catch a fish. And so a, a negative result from genetic testing is, is not necessarily meaningful. And especially if a patient had testing, you know, several years ago and, and it was negative, it might be worthwhile testing again, um, especially because the technology um, continues to improve as, as time goes on. I think that Aaron and Mark have really explained the situation well, but I, I think um, it's also worth knowing just, I have certainly recently seen patients who have gone through a panel like ID or IRD, a young-ish man who was told he had no mutations and certainly looks like he has X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. So for that patient, we have been working with Blueprint to just test the RPGR gene. Um, and the one thing I'll say is that the um, Blueprint does have a program where they can work with you to try and get the insurance to cover some of it, but it's not inexpensive. So I guess um, Mark's point about identifying the you know, not, not just fishing with a big, big net, but like trying to be a little bit thoughtful about what you're looking for, and which panel is going to be most likely to capture it um, is very, very important. Um, I also appreciate the um, value of working with genetic counselors because they really do understand the nuances of how to interpret the variance of uncertain significance. And, and, and as Mark said, you know, today's result might be different in a year because the new things are being discovered all the time. Um, and we are learning that things that once were considered uncertain are now likely pathogenic. And so I think um, continuing to monitor um, patients after the results come back and continue to remain in, com in contact and in conversation is very, very valuable to patients. It can be really demoralizing for them to get a result that isn't conclusive, um, but just reminding them that, you know, this could, this could be different tomorrow. This could be different in a year. It likely will be. So um, I, I think it's an ongoing conversation. It's not a one-time one -time deal. Often. Thank you all. This has been, um, this will hopefully be well uh, listened to and well read. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise. Gene therapy um, is science fact right now, not science fiction. It's not science fact for enough people. Uh, and your careful approaches and your experiences and your willingness to share with others and, and 
as I said before, the whole ecosystem of collaboration between um, organizations, um, surgeons, translational scientists, um, investors, um, industry is, it's a real privilege because it, it is, we are a model that's being looked at for this particular strategy to, to address afflictions beyond vision and the eye and your leadership and careful, thoughtful um, approaches are very much appreciated. So thank you all. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. This concludes today's episode on gene therapy for inherited retinal diseases. Please tune in for future episodes of New Retina Radio.